Dion. And I just a couple of reminders before we officially get started on the webinar. Just wanted to welcome everyone. Um, because of the large number of attendees, we're going to keep everyone on mute throughout the webinar. But if you have questions, please feel free to input those in the question um, chat box in the webinar. And we will get to those as soon as possible, or at least we've saved some time at the end of the webinar to go through those questions as well. Just a reminder, we are recording this webinar, so you can view it later if you'd like to review any of the material, um, as well as it'll be posted on our website for um, viewing it or forwarding it to anyone else you think would be interested. So I just wanted to give a quick view of what our agenda is. And, and go over our speakers for today. So first of all, um, basically Pantheon, at, our, at Pantheon our mission is to power the world's website. Um, so we're very excited to be here today and to have a guest speaker with us as well as um, one of our Pantheon experts here as well. So just as a quick um, intro, we have Jeff Luger, who's account manager at Pantheon, and he will really be going over the one of the main topics of our webinar today, or how to budget for higher education websites. So we'll be talking about what um, concerns or thoughts people may have around this, maybe some best practices, and how much a website costs um, for building, launching, and running. Um, Kevin Miller will also be joining us. He's a web developer at CSU Monterey Bay. And he recently worked on a large project where they were using Pantheon. So he's going to talk about his experiences there and any challenges that he faced um, and then be available to answer questions as well. At the end of the webinar, we will set aside some time for a demo to go through what does it look like running and launching um, and building a site with Pantheon. So with that, I will turn it over to Jeff. Great. Thanks, Linda. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to, um, you know, given the nature of the webinar, I wanted to encourage everyone to make this as interactive as possible. And, and if you see a little go to webinar control panel, there's a questions box down there. Um, and if you want to take a couple minutes right now just to jot down a couple questions that you would like to see us cover, that would be really helpful um, and a good, good sort of introduction to using that. And I encourage you to type in questions there as, as, um, as, much, as, you'd, as much as you'd like. Um, so basically, I, just as a quick introduction, um, I've been working at Pantheon for nearly two years now and came from a history of actually building and developing uh, websites for including a lot of university websites and came to Pantheon because I was really excited about the technology and platform of what Pantheon was doing. I felt like what we're doing was uh, sort of a, a, a true uh, paradigm shift in terms of the way that, that uh, institutions can approach um, uh, websites and that's why I wanted to become involved. Um, Basically, in terms of budgeting websites, when we talk about, about this question, or when I ask this question to anybody, um, usually what it comes down to when somebody thinks about, well, how much does a website cost? Uh, it comes down to, in their minds, two things. That there's going to be some amount of money that is going to be spent building it. Either this is money that they're paying a developer to, do, to use to build the website, or maybe this is their own time and effort in terms of sweat equity that they're putting into actually developing that website. So there's those, there's those aspects. And then the other thing that people usually consider is the amount of money that it actually costs to host the website. And depending on some various choicing, choices that you make in, regarding hosting, this could vary anything from you know, hosting a site externally um, you know, from outside of your university, or perhaps um, you know, internally, maybe you have a server underneath the desk that you that you're want to run the website off of, or maybe the university provides some sort of free hosting service that you can put that website on. But typically, when I ask that question about how much your website is going to cost, those are the two answers that first come to mind for people. Um, but I would like to propose that really when we look at university websites, um, you need to actually really think about the total cost of ownership, um, so or the TCO of, of any website. And this is really, to, to answer that question of what a website actually costs, you really need to look at the entire life cycle of a website, from the moment that you think about it to when you're actually developing it to where you're hosting it and all these other questions. So usually, when you're looking at this situation for universities, universities have very specific costs that they typically incur managing websites that go beyond just building and hosting them. 
um, particularly when they start thinking about tens or hundreds of websites. So what's that total cost of ownership when you're managing that many websites at that scale? Um, so to give you kind of a, a sampling of some of the things that I hear from universities when I work with them, because I work with universities you know, constantly across the United States um, you know, that, are, that are basically confronting these same problems. The things that I hear from universities that can, that can uh, be uh, big uh, expenses are, first of all, vendor management. Um, so a lot of universities will be working with, let's say, 10, 20, or you know, who knows how many different vendors across the university that are actually building these sites. And this might be formal vendor relationships, somebody that's actually been hired and gone through um, a, sort of a vendor process to, to actually build a site, to more informal vendors. So this could be anything from like literally a graduate student or a friend of a friend building a website or perhaps a, uh, you know, a professor doing this on his or her own. Um, so managing those vendors or those site builders can often be uh, a piece of complexity that, that uh, equals a lot of cost and time for the university to manage. The other piece of this is managing security. So you know, when you're managing all these websites across campus, there's obviously a security concern uh, to help people basically uh, do that. And, um, and so in terms of managing and maintaining security, you want to make sure that, that people are uh, following best practices. And how is it that you ensure that the university is following best practices and managing these websites? So that's another aspect of what uh, typically I see universities uh, spending a lot of time and effort on is trying to figure out some sort of security standards that they can enforce across the, across the university. And obviously there's questions about uptime. So with all of these, of all these websites, um, you know, and various properties across the campus, how do you manage and maintain uptime to ensure that these sites are being kept up and are maintaining sort of the high quality standards that the university expects from any public facing uh, um, uh, a website that would be out there. Um, the other question would be maintaining servers. So I often see universities doing any number of things when it comes to actually the, the infrastructure that's hosting the website. There often is uh, you know, free bandwidth for universities, and universities often have um, uh, their own data centers. And a lot of times, these websites are being hosted on those data centers. So there's, there's that going on. Oftentimes, also, there are, are just any number of, as I mentioned before, literally servers underneath someone's desk where someone's hosting a website, or perhaps it's a project website, or it's a departmental website, or a research site, um, and those could be you know, hosted basically anywhere. Or there'd be a number of people that are hosting things externally that the university may or may not even know about. Um, so how do you maintain and manage all of that complexity? Um, and how much does that really cost the university when you were to, if you were to add it all up in aggregate? Uh, the, other, the other piece of this that I see a lot of universities um, struggle with is in today's world, when everybody has access to the web and, and the importance of communicating on the web are, are primary, um, how does the university enforce branding and content standards across all of those websites so that basically um, what, the, what the university is putting forward is, is consistent um, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's manageable? Um, and universities can spend a significant amount of time and energy trying to basically enforce these branding and content standards to varying levels of success, as I'm sure you've, as, as sure you've seen. Um, the other question is, is uh, scaling. So how much, how much does, does this cost the university? In terms of, uh, you know, it could be scaling for a single website. Maybe a single website has a, you know, huge surge in traffic for whatever reason. Somebody wins the Pulitzer Prize or, you know, it's the, uh, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's the crunch day for admissions and everybody's, you know, whatever those, those um, uh, traffic needs are, um, how does the university address those on a site-by-site -site basis? But more importantly, how does the university think about, about scaling across the university, putting, putting the appropriate tools in people's hands so that they can basically manage um, and deploy uh, websites in a very scalable way for the university? So there's a lot of time and money that might be spent there. Um, given the complexity of all this, even budgeting can be considered as a total cost of ownership. There can be a lot of money that's actually spent in budgeting. And what I mean by this is that it can be very, very, very hard to pin down exactly what the budgets are for a lot of these projects because there's so many, um, there can be so, there, it can seem like there's so many moving parts and so much complexity. There might be um, uh, web projects that go over time because of complexity. Um, there's unforeseen complexities because of the, of the nature of the university. 
uh, you know, for example, when I was developing websites for the University of California Berkeley as a vendor, um, we had extraordinary difficulty actually accessing any production server that was on campus because of security concerns. So we needed to do all of our development outside of the university and then hand that code off and then somebody within the university had to actually go through the steps of, you know, we would give them a cookbook recipe of basically how to install what it was that we did and how to configure the servers and everything else. And you can imagine how that amounted to quite a bit of billable hours just to deal with this complexity that we had, which was that we couldn't gain access to the servers where these sites were going to be hosted. Um, and so those types of those types of things can can when you look at it in aggregate across in, in the entire university, they can be very unpredictable. They can be very complex, and and therefore the budgets can be very hard to pin down. Um, and people spend a lot of time fretting about budget, which itself can be a cost. Um, and then I think another piece of this is that you know when it, when we when we get down to it and what the promise of the web is for any for any institution, any organization, it's not just websites, but it could be very complex applications, things that are doing quite a bit. Um, and so how do you manage all of these diverse needs across campus from the small on what it is that they do to somebody who's developing uh, something, you know, uh, an archive of, of material that goes that goes way back and they want to make very searchable, or an application to help connect students around a particular cause, or whatever it is, the diversity of, of, of opportunities there and the ways that universities can leverage the web are, are huge. Um, and managing what all those diverse needs are in a way that makes sense for everybody is, is can also be um, complex and, and, and can be costly. So these are just some examples of, of some of the additional things that add up to the total cost of ownership that go well beyond when a university thinks about websites. They go well beyond just like, well, there's a cost to build it and there's a cost to host it. So on that, on that topic, you know, obviously the cloud uh, has made a lot of, of, of promises. There's a lot of potential out there, and we all know this. We, we see some incredible advances in terms of the ways that we're, we're doing things. The possibility of, of sort of not having to do it ourselves um, is, you know, we can realize big efficiencies. So, on, you know, with cloud solutions, there's the possibility of fewer headaches, of continuous innovation, of instantly provisioning things, of not having to worry about hardware and maintenance of being able to smoothly scale, of being able to, to upgrade uh, automatically, um, and, and basically uh, uh, of, there can be the possibility for a very specific solution for very specific business needs. So there's a lot of, a lot of promises out there in terms of, in terms of cloud technology. Um, but really for most, uh, when we look at cloud, uh, cloud, you know, let's say hosting, I'll put that in quotes, um, Really, what people sell often is, as the cloud is just literally moving the servers out of your data center and putting them into somebody else's data center. So what I mean by that is, end of the day, uh, for a lot of services that are selling themselves as cloud, you still, end of the day, are having servers that somebody has to manage. There's security concerns around that. There's overhead in managing all of that. There's scaling questions. And you may even have to actually pay somebody to manage all that for you. So when you talk about cloud, you know, we should talk about what the real advantages of cloud are and focus on those as opposed to just moving the servers out of your data center and into somebody else's data center. Um, so Pantheon One, you know, what we do here with Pantheon is really what we consider a, a true cloud solution that's built specifically for universities. I mean, the reason why we have this product literally has to do with what we've learned from working with, you know, uh, many, 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 many universities. Um, so let's talk about this a little bit because you know with Pantheon One, the goal here is really to make a lot of those those aspects of total cost of ownership that I was talking about previously to make that much easier and to reduce a lot of the friction and overhead that universities have in managing websites. So vendor management, we make it really easy. It's very very easy to manage vendors. Um, when I was working developing sites for UC Berkeley, if there had been something like Pantheon there at the time. I would have been able to log in, work on my project, hand it off, and it wouldn't have been a problem at all. And the university would have been able to see exactly what it is that I was doing and exactly what everybody who's working on a website was doing. Um, maintaining security, 
We're a single platform. Pantheon's managing it all for you. You don't have to worry about security concerns. Uptime, obviously, is something that Pantheon's doing. Um, you know, end of the day, we're maintaining the entire platform. Um, all of our customers literally don't even have to think about servers anymore. In fact, we don't even really have to think about servers. I mean, obviously, there's servers down there below, like they're, they're, that, 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 that at the base of our of our infrastructure. But the way that we interact it, with it is actually a layer of abstraction above that, where we provision resources entirely in software. Um, so it's a completely different model. And then Pantheon One is all about basically in, um, uh, providing tools for universities to help them enforce branding and content standards, so that so that you can give people um, uh, uh, you know ready to go sort of templates. Of, of a sort of ready to go web applications that you can control in terms of branding and content standards uh, from a centralized place. And scaling is, is very easy to add additional sites and also to, to, uh, to re respond to any additional traffic um, that you might have. We make it very easy to budget. You know exactly what the costs are. There aren't any hidden fees. It's very simple. And then, you know, end of the day, Pantheon is a platform for open source content management systems. Um, and, and Drupal is, is a phenomenal uh, solution for a diverse set of needs, um, you know, from everything from complex applications to, to more basic sort of brochure style websites. Um, so, and, and Pantheon as a platform supporting Drupal would support all of these diverse needs across campus. Um, so that's really some of the foundational stuff behind uh, Pantheon One. And, um, you know, one example in terms of these diverse needs that I wanted to that, that we you know wanted to talk about a bit is what uh, Cal State Monterey Bay has been doing with with Pantheon One um, and uh, and and their their S4 project. So this is a very um, a, it's a unique application in terms of in terms of Drupal, but not at all unique in terms of the way that P, that universities leverage Drupal and the power of Drupal to perform specific tasks at the university, and very interesting and a good a good use case of, of uh, the use of Pantheon One. So I wanted to introduce Kevin Miller to get the opportunity to talk a little bit about the S4 project. Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, and it's, yeah, it's your turn. Yeah. So uh, my name's Kevin Miller. I'm a web developer, uh, well, now lead de web developer at Cal State Monterey Bay because I have one other person. Um, and we're a, a small team uh, at CSUMB. It's uh, two developers, a user experience person, and a project manager. Um, the way that we got involved with Cal State S4 and Pantheon is uh, we were approached because we had uh, demonstrated leadership in areas like service learning and internships. Um, and the Chancellor's Office, which is kind of the people who run all 23 California State University uh, campuses, approached us and said, we'd like to, we have a business process challenge, which is how do we track where students are doing internships, um, study abroad, uh, service learning, or just work in the community. Uh, because those kind of things exposed us to legal risk. And also it was a great thing to promote the u universities and the system as a whole. If we want to be able to say, you know, hey, voters in the state of California, um, our students are doing 30 million hours of community service in your area. You can put in your, your uh, address and see what the direct impact of um, these kind of programs are on your community. Uh, so. The overarching goal, and the next slide. So the how was really about a sort of mixture of, this is CIO words, so I don't know all of them, but ERP or CRM solutions. Um, so really just how do we maintain relationships? So it's a very interesting use case for Drupal um, in that it's not a traditional content management system. It has absolutely no, you know, when you look at it, it has no relationship to a content management system, but because Drupal, we perceive Drupal as a very flexible framework for building um, things like student voting systems or intranets and stuff like that, which we've done, um, we, the, our progression to using um, Drupal for this project was kind of natural. Um, so the how of Cal State S4 uh, was that we initially approached the project as a install profile that was just an open source project that we could share with campuses. Um, and 
had a very kind of agile process there. Um, but the challenge was for our client campuses, so um, other folks who might have a very distributed IT environment where they can't just say, hey, we have this open source project, can we spin up a server with a specific environment? Um, these other campuses, you know, they couldn't talk to their IT department necessarily to get server space, or they were put in a queue for that would take a long time. Um, so we moved from a simple sort of here's the code base, install it, and have fun, don't call us, to let's actually, you know, uh, get a, a find a support line for somebody to help out. Let's host it. Uh, for these campuses. We'd had experience with other hosting providers uh, that was were more of a multi-site environment, and I think there's a blog post on Pantheon that goes into that issue, the issues we had um, uh, in the past using multi-site for all these different campuses. Um, suffice to say that uh, it was a really bad experience for me as a developer and for our support person because uh, upgrades were a big challenge. Um, so instead, we moved to Pantheon 1, um, which has allowed us to keep a single code base. Uh, the thing that I love to tell people about our experience with Pantheon 1 is our support person, who is super smart, capable, wonderful human being, but a, not a developer, uh, she actually does all of our deployments now. So uh, the fact that I can empower her to, if we're rolling out a new feature, she kind of knows what campus or what client uh, is. Uh, less risk, re less uh, adverse to change, and so she might roll features out uh, staged to a few campuses, so they can test it and play with it in their in their dev and test environments, which they really love having a separate test environment for like things like training. Um, and we've been able to leverage a lot of the tool APIs and the Pantheon exposes to say, you know, make the training environment not send email, so they can play with like bulk sending of emails. Um, so our clients really love having these three instances so they can do not only testing of new features, but training of personnel in a safe environment. Um, and we currently manage 16 different campuses, and these are entire universities, um, and we also help out with integration with student information systems. Uh, so we're using, uh, leveraging the Pantheon platform to process, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of student records, including things like courses, enrollments, um, faculty assignments, et cetera. Um, I went kind of fast there. Um, the, other, the other things that I did want to bring up in terms of our experience um, is that a, a, another area that we really appreciated with Pantheon was stable billing cycles. So in with other hosting environments, um, we were charged based on use. That's very difficult in the higher ed um, from a budgeting perspective. We'd rather just say, here, you know, here uh, is go here's the bill for uh, X number of sites, and it's a yearly cycle, and we can plan for that. So that's been very helpful from a budget planning perspective, and also the fact that um, you know many campuses, not in our system but elsewhere, have stringent security requirements that. Uh, a, a developer can't have full access to a production server, and if you're working with small teams, limited resources, that's very difficult to pull off. Um, so we've been happy to be able to say, you know, check that checkbox off security audits that even though our devs can We trade that off while we're doing the demo, um, showing various features um, mm -hmm. while we're going through it. Okay. Um, but maybe a, maybe a good starting point would would, would be literally uh, your login and what what that might look like. Um, so I just wanted to just you know as we're at this stage right here, um, if there's any questions anyone has, just go ahead and please uh, type them into the uh, control panel there, and um, and we'll and we'll make sure that we answer them. But what we would like to do 
is give you a little bit of a deep dive into the Pantheon One sort of developer's experience. And so this might be a little bit more technical than you'd like, but we'd like to show you again how, you know, as, as Kevin was saying, even a non-technical user can be trained pretty quickly about how to use this um, and so that they can do things that typically uh, would require a programmer to do, such as like doing security updates to Drupal and things like this. This is one of the ways that, that we try to basically put the control in the developer's hands so that they, you know, and, and at universities, so they can manage all of these sites more effectively. Um, so I'm going to just sort of quit out of here for a second and open up a browser window. Um, or let's see, we'll go. Okay, so what I'm showing you right now is, is basically the, the developer experience. Somebody who has a site that they'd like to build, launch, and run on Pantheon. Um, and it all starts here basically with a login. This is where basically someone would go ahead and, and log in to, to their Pantheon account. And I'm going to log out of mine so, so Kevin can log into his um, and show you exactly um, you know, what his experience is. So we also use um, uh, Pantheon for a number of others, sandbox and testing environments. So you'll see a few others. But you'll see a lot of these uh, tiles look very similar. These are all the same install profile. Um, so for example, um, we kind of eat our own dog food and host our, our own campuses instance of uh, S4 for Cal State Monterey Bay. Um, so this is like the non-logged in user experience, just illustrating impacts, et cetera, and being able to show the people that our campus works with. Um, so, so Kevin, just to, going back to the site there. So with CS, it was the with the S4. This, the like what I'm seeing here with this map. This is the location of service projects that students have done exactly. in this location. Yeah. So this is a way that that this particular campus, Cal State Monterey Bay, is able to basically track. Um, all of the service hours and, and tasks mm -hmm. that students are doing. Yeah, and the student could log in and see, um, you know, here's the courses you're taking, you know, browse the, the list of possible sites that you can work with and start that experience. Yeah. Um, so there, there's, you know, this is the non-logged in experience because I can't show a student's stuff, but um, kind of gives you the idea. And we also, you know, give users an informa information about that you're in a dev version versus the test version for training. Um, so we do, you know, host our own campuses instance of S4 um, uh, on Pantheon. So what you're, so what you're seeing here, just to just to clarify, then is uh, Kevin's shown you the public facing website, and that's that's this Drupal application that they've mm -hmm. built that does this pretty amazing thing for CSU in terms of tracking all these service hours for all these different campuses. And what he took you into was basically, um, if we, this this is a list of all of the various CSU or the the S4 website. Um, and by clicking on one of these, he's taking you into, this is, for example, um, Humboldt State University. This is the development environment for the Humboldt State website. Um, and so with, with the Pantheon development environment, the idea here is that, you know, to provide best practice guardrails for anybody who's using this. So, you know, it, it is development best practice that, that you have a dev test and live environment mm -hmm. so, that, so that people aren't making, you know, code changes directly to their live environment, potentially breaking things and risking downtime. With Pantheon, you, you have to do it in the dev environment. You have to take it through tests so that someone can actually test it before you deploy and you can take it to live. Um, you know, there's another other features. Everything's version controlled, for, for example, and, and get something that a number of developers don't want to deal with and don't want to learn about because it can be fairly complex. But no matter what you do, it's being version controlled for you uh, in Pantheon automatically. Mm -hmm. So that's another best practice. Um, backups are super easy to make. So that's another example of basically uh, a best practice to make sure that the sites on campus have an off-site backup that you can restore from at any point in time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just so easy to do that you'd be kind of negligent not to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. So those are some examples of just best practices just to give you an overview of, of, of the, mm -hmm. of the uh, dashboard here. Yeah. And so in our case, we have, you know, other workflows and tools that we use to do, you know, quality assurance work before we even test push things to our dev instance. But the, the wonderful thing from our perspective as a dev shop is that, you know, we can use all, whatever tools we want, you know, Jenkins and things like that to play and then just it's a simple merge and get 
to our um, the repository that Pantheon One pulls from, so that um, we can just say, okay, now we're ready to deploy, and that that change immediately becomes available to all 16 of our client campuses. So this is so what, what Kevin's talking about. It just to uh, reiterate uh, is that basically it's a core functionality of Pantheon One, which is that we want we give universities the ability to create one application or several if they want, um, and they they use that as a base then for all of the sites across campus, and it can have their own theming, it can have their own set of features and everything else. Um, and let's say you have 200 sites that are using it, that's great. People can add additional features on top of it and do whatever they want. But end of the day the university just goes to one place and makes any updates. Say they need to change theming or they need to add functionality. They just do it in one place and all the sites using it get a one-click update in their dashboard. Yeah. And then also, and I don't know if we want to show and make creation of a new site using that thought profile. Yeah, yeah, we, okay. could, we could do that. So but let's, it, yeah, let's go through this first. So, yeah. that, so um, you know, usually our support person will log in and say, okay, Humble, I'm going to, you know, apply their updates to their dev instance. And so she can just click and it will apply, you know, changes from the repository we have set up, and um, those become immediately available for her to do testing on. So, so is it, this is the person. She's she's not only doing this, but then she's also doing the testing. Yeah. So she's the kind of the biggest gatekeeper because she's very familiar with the product, and she kind of knows, okay, this is uh, something that is working or not working. Okay. Um, but the other, and so then she'll go through a process, and um, I'm not. We haven't communicated these changes to Humboldt, so I'm not going to click the button. But um, she'll then she can then pull those into the test environment, which again we we re re reiterate to our client campuses as kind of the place you do training. Um, the wonderful thing for them is this is a very complex application. They want to train with say faculty, and faculty want to see like students in the current course for their term. But we're really only actively syncing content from backend systems to our production system. And so they'll just pick up the phone or send an email to Tracy, our support person. And what she'll do is go in, in the test instance or the training instance, go to workflow and clone the, all of the database and live and, and files from the live environment so that um, when they then go into do training the next week, it's exactly a mirror of what they would see in production. So um, these we re really heavily use these workflow tools, especially in the test environment. But when you're deploying, it's also great too because you can then merge the data from production and the code from dev, which traditionally has been a huge pain point to maintain those kind of workflows in traditional environments. And with Pantheon, we've loved that it's been like one click. Awesome. Okay. Um, Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah. So, moving code from one from one instance to another is you know simple. Uh, the other kind of, and this is a little bit more higher ed ish too, is it, we can actually um, hand off uh, um, you know specific thing, tasks to people who really should be the ones doing it. For example, Humble has an SSL uh, certificate. I'm not, I should not touch their SSL certificate. In the past, these kind of things were, were done uh, in a very non-secure way, uh, or people gave you very complex ways of getting the cert. Um, so the fact that I can just say, oh, I'll just add you to the site, your domain person can log in and, and do all this management, um, and I don't, as, as the person maintaining the site, don't have, doesn't have to do that. Uh, that's a really good security feature. Wow, that's yeah. interesting. I've never I've never heard that before either. Yeah, yeah, that's a really that's a great that's a great advantage. Mm -hmm. What what Kevin's talking about a little bit is is sort of um, part of our of of the way that we help people manage again hundreds you know a thousand websites at an organization. So just to kind of talk about what he's talking about about inviting a, a team member. If I jump out here, I'm going to jump to uh, Kevin's sites and account here. This is what. You know, Kevin sees what he logs into his Pantheon account. Anybody with a Pantheon account would get this dashboard, and they basically see all of the sites that they are a team member of. Um, and when I say team member, so, you know, if we go to this site, for example, um, and I go up here to team, um, these are the people that are basically, are the, are, the, are the developers who would see that site and have access to that site as a developer. This is this very flexible system that makes it really easy to work with vendors uh, because 
say this site just the only people working on this site are people from this campus. Well, that's the only people that are on this team. Um, and if they wanted to add some external consultants, then they just go ahead and they would just add them right in here. If they ever needed to remove anybody for any reason, they would just do it right there. And it'd be, it'd be very, very easy for them. Um, so it just makes the whole team management process uh, um, um, much easier. And I'll show you in a bit um, how we have a layer on top of this because you can imagine with 100 sites or, you know, 200 sites or 300 sites or 1,000 sites, how there's a real power in the fact that everybody's using the same tools, the same workflows, can communicate like sort of in the same, the similar language about what they're doing, and they can all manage team members by project. So it's not like you have to worry about giving someone access to a server that there might be other projects on or anything else. No, you just give them access to the sites that they're working on. And then Pantheon One has this layer above that, which is our, it's our Pantheon One dashboard, which we'll be showing in a moment, which basically gives uh, certain, you know, administrators at the organization overview over everything. So they have access to all of the sites in the organization. They can see exactly who's on what project. They can remove team members in bulk and do a number of things that universities are commonly requesting. So I'll, I'll show that in a moment. Mm -hmm. So should we show the just creation of a new site just because that's a... Yeah. So and the, and the just so uh, we can illustrate kind of how Pantheon One also allows us to just enforce the creation of new sites um, in, a, in a really simple way is if I go to add a new site, normally in Pantheon, um, awesome S4, uh, anybody, you know, anyone can create an account and, you know, just play with Pantheon on, by themselves. They don't need, you know, to have an organization. But if you have an organization with um, Pantheon 1, when you go to create a site, you not only see the standard core you know, Drupal installs and some of the more standard open uh, pr install profiles. But I also see my Cal State S4 install profile. So when a campus, or or let's say theoretically, if I was working in a large university with hundreds of sites, I had a biology department say, "Hey, we're really interested in your platform, but we'd like to test it out." It's not a IT person tech job to create a new site for them to play. I can just you know, anybody who has access can just say install this install profile and it'll kick off that process. Mm -hmm. So our support person all the time spins up new instances in sandbox mode to do trainings and then maybe deletes them or to do demos for camp possible clients. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and start, let's, yeah, let's go ahead. On. I mean, so, you know, while while he's spinning this up in, in the huge profile though, so it takes Oh, wow. Oh, it's good to go through all the steps. Yeah. But, like, what he just did, that just took, like, one click, and it was done in about five seconds. Yeah. This was literally creating a, a, its own uh, dedicated environment for this Cal State S4 website instance. So this is, you know, dev test and live, dedicated resources, you know, scaling, all of the, you know, own, own Git repo, own database connection, everything dedicated exactly for this website. If you were to try to do what we just did in four seconds on your own, this would be three separate servers, mm -hmm. setting up the software stack for each one of those servers, making sure everything's synchronized, you know, getting the database connection working okay, setting up the dev tools. I mean, this could be a, a day of work doing it on your own. And this is the kind of thing that when you think of total cost of ownership of sites across the university, if there's hundreds of sites out there, and for every one of those sites, people are going through a day or two days of work just to build out their environment for where they're going to, you know, host this site, if you can eliminate all of that wasted expenditure of energy and instead give them a, a four second install, that's a, that's a big win. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, in the case of, in the case of some universities, um, uh, you know, UC Berkeley, for example, anybody that signs up for a Get Pantheon account with a berkeley.edu email address will see the, the, Berkeley, uh, the Berkeley distributions that will be available there for them to install with a one-click uh, install. So it's, yeah. a, it's a really nice, and then some organizations don't want to have sort of this self-serve option for everybody, but maybe just their central IT wants to have that one-step install. Yeah. So, do you, I mean, in the case of S4, you guys are the ones that are doing the actual. We're the ones paying for it, and we, we, wanna, we want to help with the onboard, or onboarding process, so we are, it's a very engaged, you know, process, we don't necessarily give that out to people, mm -hmm. um, but uh, if we were, you know, another in interesting possibility that um, I know other larger campuses deal with are even things like billing, so the ability to delegate those kind of roles to different people mm -hmm. um, would definitely be good, especially in a chargeback environment. Uh -huh. so. 
Yeah. Great. Um, well, let me. Uh, let's, I'm going to log. Uh, I'll log yeah. you out, Kevin, real okay. quick, so I can log in with my account. Um, so what I want to what I want to show you. So now I'm taking you into my account here, and you're seeing the the, the sites that I'm a team member of. Um, and then some of these organizations. So I'm actually, is it okay if I go into the Cal State S4 admin? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm going into, this is basically, this is the Pantheon 1 uh, panel, the, the Pantheon 1 dashboard that we we're talking about. So, um, and this is another one of these pieces that we put in place basically specifically for universities to lower the amount of time and the, and the, and the effort that, that uh, universities have in trying to kind of wrangle the cat in terms of all of these different websites out across campus and what they're doing. With this dashboard, you know, literally uh, you know, in the Seth Forex case, we're seeing each of the, each of the websites across, um, across Kevin's project. So, and anybody who logs in here, and in this case, I think it's basically you and maybe... And, and our support person. And your support so. person has access to this. But they'd be able to click into any one of these sites um, and, and gain immediate access. So if I go here, that would take me immediately into that into that Pantheon dashboard. Um, some other um, uh, some other great features about this is that you know you can imagine in this case there are how many sites do you guys there's how many sites total? Six, eight, seventeen, twenty, twenty three sites or so. So they have like twenty three sites, but you can imagine if there's five hundred or a thousand websites um, that you're going to need some some. sort these by service level, which ones are at that service level, or which ones are at this service level, um, which ones are, are free sandbox accounts, um, you know, and, uh, and then you can, of course, sort by the developers and things like that. In the case of, uh, you know, here we are looking at actually the, the people who are, are parts of this organization, you can manage those people there, um, and there are the sites. Um, we're just, um, let's see if it's, Yeah, so then you know, there's other things that we can do. A lot of, a lot of universities have reporting uh, requirements. So, uh, you know, if you were to select all sites, for example, um, and go to this More button, there's a Export to CSV, which will export basically some data and reporting based on all of these websites. So that if, if you have requirements around sort of um, regular audits around the websites that you have on Pantheon um, and what they're doing and who the team members are and things like that, you can go ahead and export a CSV file so you can use that for your reporting. Um, the other thing that's been uh, a new, one of the things to emphasize about this is that Pantheon's a SaaS platform. So SaaS uh, stands for Software as a Service. So this is a software product rather than existing on your computer that you're interacting with. It exists out there on the web. It's a web application. But what it means is that we are continually adding new features and updating things. Uh, so, you know, one feature that was added recently based on requests from universities is they say, hey, we have 300 sites out there, and for each one of those sites, the developers are submitting, you know, tickets and getting support from Pantheon. We would want one place where we can see basically all of those support tickets. So recently, we rolled out basically this feature here, where which will show an organization exactly that complete ticket history for all of the websites across, you know, all of all of campus, um, and that's that's just available there for you as well. Here's the uh, product portion of this. This is what um, Kevin was talking about in terms of their their install profile or their or their custom Drupal distribution, but this is what they've developed that then creates that one click install option for everybody using it on campus. Um, and so this is where you would add those products. Um, so basically, this is a, a a quick rundown then of of uh, of the dashboard here. Um, Do you have, um, do you have, in terms of your use of this dashboard, do you have anything you want to add about this? Um, not really. I mean, to be honest, we don't have as many as other campuses. Mm -hmm. I could see you just this, the improvement just in the list of if you have 300 sites you have access to, mm -hmm. a lot of boxes is probably not the best way mm -hmm. to find them. Mm -hmm. um, but, and we actually stumbled upon this feature. Uh, oh, only recently. Only recently. <laughs> so we updated the logo and uh, things like that. but. Um, uh, we we actually kind of liked it because we we do have to keep on top of what our contract is and things like that. So yeah, it makes it much easier. Yeah, and you know as a as a as a 
SaaS platform again, we are updating and, and rolling out features constantly. Um, some things that, that we are actively working on that are often requested are things like, um, you know, which of these sites need a Drupal, uh, a Drupal you know, core update mm -hmm. um, and a filter button on that. So that very quickly you could see which sites hadn't done a, a core update and therefore might be insecure. And as an admin, you'd be able to potentially reach out to the site owners if, if you're in more of a, a model where it's a little bit more decentralized and say, hey, site owner, it might be time to do this update. All you have to do is log into Pantheon and click the, the update button. Um, or maybe you're in a situation uh, where you would be doing the updates yourself and, you, and it's a good way for you to keep track of that. Um, so that's one, one feature that, that's uh, being added shortly here. Another feature that's being added shortly is that, well, this is great. I can sort by, you know, sandbox. I can sort by pro. I can sort by personal. Um, how about the ability to sort by whatever I want to? So we are we're about to roll out a free tagging system. So you know, oftentimes a central IT department will be managing several different accounts, um, and so that you would be able to basically tag uh, tag certain projects by account, and then and then sort by account so that you can go ahead and and do separate billing, for example, if you're in some sort of chargeback mm -hmm. to that account. Um, or things like that. So it creates a, a, a lot of flexibility um, basically to manage that. Um, so maybe this is a good time. You know, we've got about 14 minutes left. Maybe this is a great time to start getting into a few of the questions here. Um, so. Hi. So everybody, this is Jesse. I've been sitting in the room and lurking the entire time, but I'm going to jump on right now and open up uh, some of the questions that you have in here. Uh, so James Rice wants to know, uh, he sees in the demo there are a bunch of different sites shown. Uh, pricing on Pantheon, is it per site or is it a matter of cumulative size and traffic when we're looking at pricing for budgeting for the university? Okay, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. So, so basically, um, Pantheon's model, uh, because every site is basically receiving dedicated resources, they get their own dev test and live, their own, their own Pantheon instance, their own ability to scale, their own support channel, all of those things, Pantheon pricing typically um, tracks on a per site basis. Um, and then in terms of the requirements for each site, Sites vary, and they vary they vary quite a bit across campus. So some sites are very, very, very modest in terms of traffic requirements. I mean, it's the Student Chess Club, or it's the Ultimate Frisbee Team uh, website, or it's a professor blog. And then other websites are, are the you know very high traffic, the primary website for the entire university. So so the answer is Pantheon pricing basically does both. There's it it, it will it, it tracks you know for the Pantheon one uh, pricing, it basically tracks the number of sites. Um, and then it also uh, tracks what those sites need from a requirement standpoint in terms of traffic. Mm -hmm. and, and if I can just piggyback on that, the addition of having new relic uh, integration into Pantheon has been very helpful for us to determine when is the site moving, potentially moving in, in, in traffic from a one level to another. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so New Relic is a. If you're not familiar with it, it's a it's a it's a third-party performance mm -hmm. analysis tool and also sort of traffic analysis tool. Yeah. Um, but it gives you very granular insight. Uh, you know, developers very granular insight into the to what their site's doing. And that we have a. I think it's the pro version of New yeah. Relic available yeah. through the dashboard free. Um, and and that 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 is really a helpful tool mm -hmm. for people. So. So uh, the next question that's up is from uh, Gauri from UCSF. Um, Gauri says, we don't have the multi-dev plan, um, but with the plan they have, I'm guessing it's probably a basic or pro. Gauri's wondering how they can do development in parallel with multiple features uh, without multi-dev, and also whether or not, Kevin, uh, you're using multi-dev. OK, yeah, a bunch of questions. So that, I mean, that's good. Thanks for, the, thanks for the question about that. What I want to show you really quickly, um, just for everybody that doesn't know about this multi-dev thing, this is uh, one of the big features that we rolled out uh, last, I don't know, six months ago or so. Um, and to show this to you, I'm going to go to basically what it is, is, you know, look, we're a modern platform. We can provision resources entirely in software. Why limit ourselves to just dev test and live for every site that's out there on Pantheon? And so what we did is basically created what we call multi-dev, which is as many 
cloud development environments as you want before development. So what it sort of looks like um, is this. So I'm going into a Pantheon account here. This is more of, oh, thank you, Jesse. <laughs> this is more of a tool that, uh, you know, large teams, complex projects might use. So rather than just having this dev environment, we have this multi-dev environment that has any number of branches. These are, you know, in sort of Git, Git terminology, these are, these are actual branches. Um, and each one has its own uh, environment. So I just clicked into this environment called Jeff. You know, I have my own URL. I've got my own connection information here. I have um, my own uh, history, um, you know, my own set of backups, everything. And anything that I do here, basically, those changes I can merge up into dev pretty simply. Um, so uh, the question uh, from UCSF, Gowry, um, if you are interested in playing with this a little bit, you should just send me an email. My name is, uh, it's, you know, my email is jeff at getpantheon.com. Um, and I am happy to sort of, uh, you know, see if I can get something set up for you just to sort of test it out. But in the absence of multi-dev, what people typically do is they'll develop things locally. Um, and so each, you know, of course, then you have the issue of having to set up basically a development environment on your laptop or wherever you're doing local development. Um, and then each developer might have their own, lo you know, local machine set up that way. Uh, and pushing changes up that way. So that, that, those are the development patterns that I've seen, but it'd be interesting to hear, Kevin, about how, how you manage it. Yeah, so for S4, we don't, and it's, uh, we don't currently use multi-dev primarily because we, we built an infrastructure around testing before multi-dev was available. Um, however, we are working on another very large project for our campus um, that it, we, where we are leveraging multi-dev, and it's been especially helpful since we're interfacing with you know, our team and an external uh, uh, external uh, company, um, so we can actually use standard Gitflow, what's typically called Gitflow development that everyone's familiar with, um, and not step on each other's toes. So that's been very helpful. Excellent. Uh, so we have another question from Gowry. Uh, we don't notice that Pantheon doesn't have the Git branch feature, and what is the reason behind that decision? Um, well, so you, that's, that's a good question. So in terms of, in terms of Git integration on Pantheon, you know, we only go so deep with that. So we, we support, you know, we have a certain number of things that are there that are available basically in the dashboard. Um, but you can, you know, with this multi-dev feature, you would be branching. When you create these environments, you are literally branching um, uh, your, your master branch or your master. So, so that, that functionality is there. Um, but, but you can also, you can continue to use, like, Something like GitHub or set, you know, uh, to do, you know, a dev branch with feature branches, and then that's the way that we usually work. And then we did, then we say, okay, now we're ready to push this into the dev environment in Pantheon, so we can actually do a lot of testing after our local testing. And then that's a very simple, just add another remote and push it. Okay. Uh, so we don't have any more user-submitted questions, but I actually wanted to ask a question. I worked at a university for a little bit. Uh, and any time that you're trying to implement such a large change, you have a lot of stakeholders who uh, are voicing their opinions. And I'd be really curious to hear about kind of the challenges and the hurdles that are there for adoption and implementation, um, and Kevin, your experiences with it, and then Jeff working with universities, how you found people to be able to get around this, or kind of how you can deal with this as an IT person. So, um, I mean, I, we're fortunate in that we, we don't really have those, I hate to say it, we don't have those problems at my campus just because we're so small, but um, I do definitely, my colleagues at other campuses have this challenge. I think the, the fact that you can, you don't have to commit to something, to a long-term agreement, um, that there is a flexibility in Pantheon to say, let's, you know, it's uh, five or six sites of budget depth from our, from a university's perspective. So let's try it. Let's do a pilot. Let's illustrate success, and then re-engage if about growth. Um, so I think that's you know a great strategy that you can even kind of do a grassroots thing in a campus of, look, I spun a site up while we were having an argument in the meeting <laughs> about it, and so let's, let's, let's play with it. So I, the fact that there's low risk for piloting, uh, I think, is, 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 would provide leverage for somebody who wants to explore Pantheon. 
Cool. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that's that's usually when I talk with universities that are that are trying to make a big decision like that. It, it is true that it takes a long time, and there absolutely are, um, you know, to go through that process and, and try to decide on, you know, how the university is going to approach content management and 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 whether it's going to be Drupal or you know those types of decisions can be long and, and take a long time. And meanwhile. There's nothing stopping anyone from the university who is already using you know, sort of open source content management systems from basically, uh, you know, spinning them up on Pantheon themselves and just getting going right away. Um, you know, there's this ability you could just sort of sign up for self-serve plans and just if you have the ability to swipe a credit card, you can go ahead and do that. And some universities uh, can't do that, so we, you know, sometimes we'll be able to work with you to work within your billing structure for those small sites just to test things out. Um, and, and usually the pattern is, you know, by the time we're talking to a university by, about Pantheon 1, there's a number of developers at the university that already have a lot of experience with Pantheon, love the tools, can really make a case for how much time this is saving them and, and, and how much the, uh, it, it could save the university in terms, of, in terms of managing, you know, many more sites. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm trying to think. I think I have one more question for maybe Kevin. Um, could you tell us some lessons learned? Uh, in terms of budgeting out for uh, higher education websites or anything around managing the projects and pushing them out? Um, that's a great question. I think, and, and our model is that we'd, we've adopted a very uh, kind of, we like to say we're a startup in the CSU and we approach projects in a kind of a startup way, uh, which means I, I think the most important thing for success uh, in the web, any web project is uh, uh, transparency um, and you know having tools like this that allows you to say here's what we're thinking about you know the new camp like we're we're launching a rethought entirely rethought campus website in the next four months and we move very quickly uh, probably faster than a lot of other higher education people are used to. Um, but the fact that we can say on day one, like, here's the site. Yeah, it's like default Drupal, but you can log in next week and see what we've been doing. Um, that is, both really helps get people engaged in the process and also helps identify a lot of issues when you find you, every university has hidden stakeholders. Um, so by using tools that allow you to um, release early and often and being transparent in terms of like blogging often about the process of the project, uh, that can really help identify hurdles early. Cool. So. All right, so I think we're pretty much nearing the end here unless anybody has any final thoughts or anything that they want to say about higher education and Pantheon and implementing sites. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody for your time coming today and, and thank Kevin specifically for, for coming up and joining us in our at the Pantheon headquarters here in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and um, and if you have any additional questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Um, you can email me at jeff at getpantheon.com um, and, and certainly I'm happy to answer any questions or even hop on the phone if you want to talk a little bit more specifically about any of this. But thanks again for your time and, um, and thanks, Jesse, for joining us as well and I uh, hope to see you in the future. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye.